all that you can. Stand. 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 Thank you, Lord. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. But stand. Finances are off yeah. and crazy. Yeah. Stand, stand when the children are acting foolish. Stand, hallelujah, when your faith has weakened. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Whatever, whatever you're facing, stand. Don't lose heart. Oh, we are serving the God, the man that's greater than any man. Bibles in your hands. We want to go to Psalm 73, verse 2. Psalm 73, verse 2. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 73, verse 2 says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. <laughs> Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for your word. Yes, yes. Lord, I thank you, God. I pray for the hearers, oh God, that you would anoint them to receive this word. Lord, I surrender my will to your will. Lord, I pray that you would allow me to speak the things you would only have me to say that I was speaking of the oracles of God and that this word is already blessed will be a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I would like to use as my topic, do not lose your footing. And as a subtopic, stay focused. <laughs> Do not lose your footing. And the subtopic is to stay focused. I tell you, if you are just standing, you will not lose your footing. When you are standing in Christ, standing in his word, standing on what he is saying to you, you will not lose your footing. And that's what the psalmist was saying. He said, when you've done everything, stand. <laughs> when you've cried and when you've prayed and when you've gone through, stand. Now, when we look at Psalm 73, Psalm 73 deals with the prosperity of the wicked. The prosperity of the wicked is a perplexing question. It is like the problem that was dealt with in the book of Job. Why do the wicked flourish? Sometimes the righteous suffer, but God's people have everything that matters. The wicked, with all their wealth, are de destined for destruction. Now, seeing godless people thrive, even as they hatefully mock God, while believers suffer, leads many people to a crisis to a crisis of faith. This was the case for ASAP. Now, using exaggerated imagery, he complains to the Lord that it seems as if evil people have easy lives while godly people suffer. Doesn't that seem like that's the way today? Amen. It seems like the wicked are just advancing in all that wickedness and all the things they are plotting and planning while the righteous 
seem to be doing or getting most of, receiving most of the suffering. Now, it says, further reflection reminds Asaph that sin does lead to consequences, both in this life and the next. He confesses his sins of bitterness and resolves to trust God more deeply. Now, the word Asaph means Jehovah has gathered. Asaph sounded the symbols before the Ark of the Covenant, which was moved from the house of Obed-Edom to Jerusalem. That was found in uh, 1 Chronicles 14, verses 16 through 19. Asaph's family became one of the three families given responsibility for music and song in the temple. 1 Chronicles 25, 1 through 9. And there's nothing like music. It's nothing like worship. It, it prepares us for the word. Yes. Hallelujah. It yes. sets the stage for the word. We're not only worshiping God, but it has a twofold purpose. Hallelujah. Now, following the captivity, 128 singers from this family returned from Babylon and conducted the singing when the foundations of Zerubbabel's temple were laid. And that's in Ezra 2, 4 to 2, verses 41 and chapter 3 and 10. It says 12 Psalms, which is Psalms 50, and then Psalms 78 through 83 are attributed to the family of Asaph. They were worshipers. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, let's, let's define the word footed. Footed. It's the basis or foundation on which anything is established. The basis or foundation on which anything is established. Our foundation is based on Jesus Christ, the truth. But today we are hearing that there's no absolute truth. But we know, we know better than that. Yeah. We know better than that. And then it also means a secure and established position. What position are you standing in? What position are you standing in in light of truth? Sometimes people lose their footing because they've been hurt. They've been disappointed. You know, sometimes they had more expectations of people. What people need to know that Christians are not perfect. We are just forgiven. We are not perfect people, you know, and we are forgiven. And many times people lose their footing in their belief and faith in Jesus Christ because they have been hurt. But guess what? We've all been hurt. The Lord tells us to forgive those that hurt us. Bless our enemies. You know, we have to walk in the spirit of forgiveness. I tell you, if I could have easily lost my foot in many times as a pastor, as a leader. But you have to look beyond the faults of people, pray for them, bless them. Because guess what? When you bless for them, when you bless your enemies and those that have hurt you, I heard that that blessing that you send that way, if they don't receive it, wow. <laughs> it's their loss. But it's our responsibility to bless them and to pray for them and to forgive them. Now, what does the word focus mean? Focus, the ability to concentrate one's attention or to sustain concentration. You know, sometimes when you're in the church or sometimes, you know, even when you're reading the Bible at night or even in the morning, many times when you open up the word and distractions come, the phone will ring, you know, or either while you're reading, so many things are going through your mind, what you need to cook for dinner or who you need to call. You know, that's just the enemy bringing distractions so you can lose your foot in. But we, we, do, we need not to lose our footing. You know, sometimes you see people go on vacations and go up to a high mountain and want to take a selfie of themselves. And then they end up falling over the cliff because they're so involved in themselves. Asaph was involved in himself. When he was sitting there comparing how the wicked was prospering, he was, he was look, he was, that was self-pity. 
He was depressed because the wicked were prospering and it seemed like the righteous were just suffering. The, ha, ha, ha. the Bible says if we suffer with him, we're also going to reign with him. Yes. This is a suffering way. Yes. Hallelujah. Did you not know this is a suffering way? Job, you know, he was accused of a man being full of sin. His friends accused him. And he, he was just so, you know, he was just, he, he was so disillusioned. Well, how in the world can I be, no, 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 no. I don't understand why good people have to suffer. But bad things happen to good people. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. So we have to learn to stay focused. Do not lose your footing. And stay focused. So now, now that I've given you uh, some background about, you know, the scripture text, my first question is, do you focus more on the negative or the positive? Numbers 13, verses 25 through 29. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Now God told the Israelites that the promised land was rich and fertile. Not only that, but he also promised that the bountiful land would be theirs. When the spies reported back to Moses, they gave plenty good reasons for entering the land. But they could not stop focusing on their fear. Talk of giants, descendants of Anak, and fortified cities made it easy to forget about God's promise to help. Now, when facing a tough situation, do not let the negative cause you to lose sight of the positive. Weigh both sides carefully. You know, we have to weigh the pro and the cons. Do not let potential difficulties blind you to God's power to help and promise to God. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, you're looking at the giants. They were looking at the giants in the, in, 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 in the city there and said the grapes were so big, <laughs> they brought back these gigantic grapes. But they were saying the people, the giants were so big that they said we look like grasshoppers compared to them. Yes. So you have to know who you are in Christ. Yes. Because there are some people you will meet today that they will act so superior and they'll act like they're better than you that you will feel like you're a grasshopper in their presence. Yes. But you need to know who you are in Christ. Yes. Hallelujah. You, you are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. Hallelujah. You have to know who you are. People are making you look like you're a grasshopper around, or even an ant. <laughs> even an ant. There are some people that have that superior attitude. No, God likes humility. Not, not, not even a false humility either, though. Because there's false humility. <laughs> People can act so humble, but it's just a, a fake. <laughs> Numbers 13, 26 says, although Kadesh was only a desert oasis, it was a crossroads in Israel's history. When the spies returned to Kadesh from scouting the new land, the people had to decide either to enter the land or to retreat. They chose to retreat and were condemned to wander 40 years in the desert. It was also at Kadesh that Moses disobeyed God. When the people were murmuring, complaining, why did you bring us out here to die? We don't even have water. 
And in uh, Numbers chapter 20, verses 7 through 12, God commanded Moses to strike the rock only once. But he was so angry because of the people's attitudes of mur murmuring and complaining, he struck the, he struck the rock twice. And because of that, he did not enter into that promised land. Neither did Miriam nor Aaron. Aaron. Marion died there and, and also Aaron. So we have to realize that, um, but because of the Israelites' lack of faith, they needed more than a lifetime to go from Kadesh to the Promised Land. I heard it was on a short distance. Yeah. But they, and they, and they ended up marking time 40 years. Yeah. But what was so miraculous? Can you imagine us walking in the same shoes for 40 years? No. They said that shoes didn't wear no. out, that clothes no. didn't wear out. No. I mean, I know my clothes wear out. I have to buy new yes. garments and gowns and different nightgowns and different things. They wear out yes. 40 years. So God's grace was with them those 40 years. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and sometimes we get to the place when we're about to lose our footing, we'll be walking in circles, walking in circles. Hallelujah. Numbers 13 and 27 says, The promised land also called the land of Canaan was indeed magnificent. As the 12 spies discovered, the Bible often calls it the land flowing with milk and honey. Although the land was small, 150 miles long and 60 miles wide, its lush hillsides were covered with figs, dates, and nut trees. It was the land God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Numbers 13 and 28 says, The descendants of Anak were a race of abnormally large people. The family of Goliath may have been descended, may have been descended from these people. You remember the story of David and Goliath? How he took up five stones and, 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 and his brothers were afraid of Goliath and Yet, he was a young, young person, and he picked up five stones, and he looked up at that child. First, they tried to put the gear of the giant, or his uh, giant's equipment on him, and he says, I can't move around with all this. <laughs> Sometimes we are weighted down with stuff, you know, yeah. that we can't move around in. The Bible says, lay outside every weight, every sin. They're so easy to beset us. Sometimes, you know, it's not always sin, but it can be weight that we are carrying. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else's burdens that we are carrying. And it can weigh us down, and we can't get, fight that fight and have that victory. But anyway, David, you know, he gathered those stones, and he just took his strength, his slingshot. <laughs> and he took that slingshot, and he hit it right in the temple of that big man. He said, look, you might be big, but you're going to fall quick. <laughs> don't, don't, get it, don't, don't, don't get all upset because a person seems to be big and you so little. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. No, 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 no. The greater one is in us. Yes. <laughs> says, Numbers 20, 13, 28, 29 says, the, the 45 cities the spies talked about were surrounded by high walls as much as 20 feet thick and 25 feet tall. Guards were often stationed on top where there was a commanding, where there was a commanding view of the countryside. And I was thinking about the fact that when a city is fortified with walls, it's for protection. But sometimes as people of God, we put we put our walls around ourselves. Have you ever been around a person you can't get through to them? It's like they put up a wall against you and you can't seem to reach them. Yeah, because they put up, up a wall, you know. It's a defense mechanism yeah. that, you know, they, they won't give you the hand, but they have the wall. <laughs> Amen. Yes. But guess what? <laughs> Wars can come coming in down. Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty. What is it? Had, had a great fall. Walls can come and fall down. Yes. And sometimes you need to break those walls that sometimes some of us are carrying around us because we don't want, you know, maybe bother with certain people or 
whatever the case may be, we have to kind of get rid of these walls. Yes. Because you can't be a blessing to others with walls, being surrounded with walls. Yes. Do you think you can? No. Amen. You cannot be that blessing God wants you to be when you have, and you are surrounded with walls. Yes. Walls of arrogance. Walls of, I know I'm better than you. Whatever kind of walls, we have to, we have to look, break them. Let, let them come down. Yeah. Number two, how we lose our focus. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if he received another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Now, 2 Corinthians 11.3 says the Corinthians uh, sincere and pure devotion to God being threatened was threatened by false teachings. Paul did not want the believers to lose their single-minded love for Christ. Keeping Christ first in our lives can be difficult when we have so many distractions threatening to sidetrack our faith. Just as Eve lost her focus by listening to the serpent, we too can lose our focus by letting our lives become overcrowded and confused. Is there anything that weakens your commitment to keep Christ first in your life? How can you minimize the distractions that threaten your devotions to him? You know, here they were preaching about another Jesus, a complete another gospel. And people today will come you know, and it, it just grieves me so when we raise about children in the fear of the Lord and in truth, and once they get into college, they are challenged by these agnostics and atheist professors, and when they come home, half of them don't even believe in God and Jesus anymore. And it's so sad. It is so sad. It is so sad. You know, and, and you, I mean, the children need to be rooted and grounded and know in whom they believe. Because, you know, sometimes people decide, you know, so many things. But 2 Corinthians 11, 4 says the Corinthians believers fell for smooth talk and messages that sounded good and seemed to make sense. Some of these professors will make those students feel like they are nothing. But then on the other hand, there are some of them that are such smooth talkers that they will make them wonder and think, oh, maybe Jesus isn't God. But he is God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word is God. In the beginning, when he said, let us uh, create man, when he created the world, when he created the universe, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was there. God, Elohim, meaning plural. They were all there. And then you have the people, you know, they, they're coming and they knock on your door, and they want to give you a track. And that Bible says in the beginning was the word, and the word was a, was a God, a small G-O-D, and they do not even acknowledge him as being the God, but a God. Well, that chair could be a God, a tree could be a God for those that believe in those types of things. I mean, even, even when we looked at the people of Canaan, and, and, and the Amorites and the Jebusites and all those people, they were paganists. They were heathens. Yeah. They believed in many gods. Yeah. But we believe in the true and living God. Yeah. We believe in the true and living yeah. God. Yeah. There are people that believe that God, you know, he was just a prophet and a good man. But Jesus said to his disciples, he said, have you been so long with me that you don't know who I am? They were losing their footing. Some of them were losing, Thomas lost his footing. Yes. Yeah. And Judas. Yeah. Yes, Judas and Thomas. They lost their footing. He says, have I been with you so long that you don't know who I am? When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. Me and the Father are one. Yeah. And there's a scripture in 1 John that talks about the fact that if, 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 a, if a person wants to go to God, if they don't go through the Son, 
they can't reach God. And if you don't have the, if you don't have the son, you can't have the father. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Don't lose your footing and stay focused. Don't let things that you've experienced make you lose your belief in who Jesus is. He's a spirit. When the woman at the well came to him and came to seek water, and he began to reveal everything about her <laughs> and just, just told her whole history and her whole story. And, and he said to her, you know, she said, but look, you must, you, you, you must be the Messiah or you must be a prophet because for you, for you know all this about me. We have to know and believe who God is and don't allow our circumstances to, to come against our disbelief in who Jesus is. He is God. He is God. He is our Savior. He is our Deliverer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's the one that came to set us free. Hallelujah. There are people in hell right now because they rejected his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Oh, they were believing so many things. They were believing so many lies. So 2 Corinthians 11 and 4 says, the Corinthians believers fell for smooth talk and messages that sounded good and, 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 and seemed to make sense. Today there are many false teachings that seem to make sense. Do not believe someone simply because he or she sounds like an authority or says words you like to hear. Search the Bible and check his or her teachings against God's word. Yeah, yeah. The Bible should be your authoritative God. Do not listen to any authoritative preacher who contradicts God's word. The false teacher distorted the truth about Jesus and ended up preaching a different Jesus, a different spirit than the Holy Spirit, and a different gospel than God's way of salvation. The people are trying to say there are many ways to God. There's only one way. And Jesus is that way. Hallelujah. Because the Bible is, the, is God's unfallible word. Those who teach anything different from what it says are both mistaken and misleading. Number three, your focus should be kept on God and not yourself. Judges 15, 18, and he was sore thirst and called on the Lord and said, thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant and now shall I die for thirst? and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? <laughs> now Samson was physically and emotionally exhausted after a great personal victory. His attitude declined quickly into self-pity. Must I now die of thirst? And how many of us know the story about Samson? We know emotionally we are most vulnerable after a heroic effort or when faced with physical needs. Severe depression often follows great achievements. So do not be surprised if you feel drained after a personal victory. During these times of vulnerability, avoid the temptation to think that God owes you for your efforts. He doesn't. <laughs> it was his strength that gave you victory. Concentrate on keeping your attitudes, actions, and words focus on God instead of yourself. Woe is me. Oh, I've been wounded. Oh, I'm hurt. No, 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 no. No, we got the victory. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> I've got the victory. Hallelujah. <laughs> I've got the victory. Hallelujah. I've got the victory. Hallelujah. I've got the victory. Hallelujah. And 
what the Bible says, every knee's going to bow. Yes. Every tongue is going to confess. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Now, if Asaph had kept his focus on God, he would not have had to become envious of the wicked. The very first tool Satan uses against us is discouragement, which comes from various distractions. He would love for us to lose our footing, thereby causing us to lose our focus. Asap had run down the life of the wicked in comparison to his life. Another tool which causes discouragement is comparing ourselves with others. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 12 states, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some of that, some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. If it is not wise to compare ourselves with the righteous, we dare not compare ourselves with the wicked. Now, if the Bible tells us we don't compare ourselves one to another, because if we do, we still will be devoured one of another. So if we don't compare ourselves to the righteous, why would we compare our life to the wicked that seem to be so successful and we're over here suffering? Because the devil wants to make you lose your footing and to be distracted. Hallelujah. Does that make sense, church? Hallelujah. Asap had really lost it. He was depressed, despondent, and disillusioned. The devil will try to make us feel that our salvation and relationship with the Lord is not working in our behalf because of the trials and tribulations we face. The reason we are facing them because God is trying to work out patience in our lives build up our character, and many trials we go through simply because we are saved. You just, it's just a suffering way. Yeah. Hallelujah. James 1, 3, and 4 says, Knowing this, that the trial of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect entire, wanting nothing. <laughs> and because we know this, we can surely reflect on James 1 and 2. My brethren, count it all joy <laughs> when you fall into diverse temptations. First Peter 4, 1 and 2 states, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that had suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should, have, should live the rest of his time in the flesh, to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now, Job, really, <laughs> Job needs to know this. Yeah. <laughs> he needed this scripture back then in the day. Yeah. He was suffering because, I mean, he had already been declared by God he was a righteous man. Yeah. You see, he had already been declared, but his friends were telling him he was sick because he was Sinful. Sin was in his life. Yes. Yes. People will tell you that because you're sick. But sickness came because of the fall of Adam and yes. Eve. Everybody here, we're deteriorating. Mm -hmm. Everybody here right now, we are dying. Every day. Yes. So, do not lose your footing. Stay focused. Asap learned that God's way is in the sanctuary. Psalm 77, 13 says, The way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? <laughs> and that the way of the transgressor or the wicked will be destruction. Psalms 37, 38. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. Now, the sanctuary is a local assembly, but we realize that we are the sanctuary as well. We're the temple of God. 
uh, it is a local assembly, is a place we need to be committed to on a regular basis for the sake of refueling, learning the word of God and encouraging our brothers and sisters in the Lord. I am much aware that the sanctuary and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. But Jesus so graciously reminded us in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exalting one another so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now, 10 horsepower are greater than one. There's power and strength in numbers. The word of God that we learn in the sanctuary should be applied daily. This helps keep us focused and help keep us, you know, uh, from losing our footing. And we think, when we think about the sanctuary, the sanctuary is a consecrated, holy thing or place, especially a sanctuary or a palace, whether of Jehovah or of idols. Can you imagine people that believe in idols and, and all kinds of worship? They call their places a sanctuary as well. Can you imagine that? A hallowed part like a chapel. And also, an asylum is considered to be a sanctuary. Metaphorically, a uh, sanctuary means to refer to a place of refuge. <laughs> I think that was the scripture that God is our present help and our refuge. Okay, number four, we should have love for the sanctuary of the house of God. Psalms 26 and 8 says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where that honor dwelleth. Number five, blessings are pronounced upon us. Psalms 8 and 4 and 4, blessed are they that dwell in thy house and they will still be praising thee. Number five, let us consider other benefits God's house is, his sanctuary. It's a refuge in times of trouble. Isaiah 37 and 1. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Two is a place of instruction. Micah 4 and 2. And many nations shall come and say, come. And let us go up to the mountains of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So it's a place of instruction. It's a place of refuge. It's a comfort in old age. Luke 6, Luke 2, verses 36 and 37. And there was Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Aser. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. A comfort in old age. The sanctuary is the example of Christ, Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And that was Jesus. Number five, the example of the apostles in Luke 24, 52 and 53. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And this is when Jesus, you know, went, of course, left, ascended into heaven so the Holy Spirit could come. He said, it's, it's expedient that I go away. But the, the, the disciples, you know, they continued in praising and in blessing God. I do not know what many of you are going through, but I know it's 
Some of us are going through something. One thing I do know, we are either in the middle of a battle, coming out of one, or about to enter one. You know, and when you think, because when you think about the fact that when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and Satan left him for a season because he knew he was coming back yeah. to taunt him, just like he comes back to taunt us. He tells us, you know, in our minds, you know, you're not going to make it, you're not successful, this and that. And sometimes we believe more of his lies than what God's truth is saying. So whatever you're going through, we just pray that none of you would leave here the way you came. Yeah, yeah. Satan desires to sift all of us as wheat, to make us lose our footing and become unfocused by distractions. Many have come with various burdens that we should not take back home with us, but instead come and lay them at the altar of the sanctuary. Proverbs 3 and 13 and 23 says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. And verse 23 says, Then shall thou walk in the way of safe, in the walk, pardon me, then shall thou walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. Do not lose your footing. Stay focused. Amen? Amen? For those that are listening to this message on Facebook, perhaps you've lost your footing. You lost your footing because you, you were possibly hurt in the church. You lost your footing, possibly because you feel like the things you wanted and the things you desired never came your way. You might have lost your footing because you were taught, you know, that if you confess everything, that you will receive everything. But sometimes our confessions and we ask for things amiss just to consume it on our own lust. So whatever your reason for you losing your footing, I want to encourage you today. You can be planted by the rivers of water. <laughs> Ooh, glory to God. You can be planted by the rivers of water that will bring forth his fruit in his season because you'll be rooted and grounded in the things of God. So if you're out there and you, you have lost your foot in it, and if you're out there and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, pray this prayer with me. Father God, I know that you sent your son that I may be saved. Jesus, come and live on the inside of me. Fill me with your spirit. And write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Be my Lord, my Savior, and my friend. And to the backslider, to the one that lost their footing, to the one that, that, that didn't stay focused and they've been distracted and then they're in a backslidden state, know that God is married to the backslider. All you have to do is confess that you've fallen short and missed the mark. And Jesus will forgive you of all your sins, cleanse you from the sin that you confess, and then cleanse, forgive you of the sin that you confess, and then cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So just confess your sins and ask the Lord to forgive you. 
and begin to walk in the newness of life. So if you prayed that prayer with me the first time, believer and the backslider, give us a call or check our website out. Send us an email. Our website is www.rcfchurch.org. And if you desire to call us, call us at 856-629-1764. The church is rejoicing with you. Hallelujah. The angels are rejoicing with you. Hallelujah. 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 And whatever you do, don't lose your footing. Don't, be, don't lose your faith in who Jesus is. Don't lose your footing. Know who God is and know who Jesus is. 